want to put it into a little bit of context first. Um, my first career was with Pacific Data Images, which I founded and ran for 20 years. And when we started it in 1980, we did it with the goal of someday in the future being able to create fully computer animated feature films. And it took us 15 years to do that. During that 15 years, we had to develop the skills and the tools and the technology. We relied heavily on Moore's Law to solve a lot of problems for us. Um, and during that time, we also got to bring some pretty iconic characters to the screen as we learned how to do character animation. Uh, Waldo C. Graphic was the first puppeted character that Jim Henson did. We brought the Pillsbury Doughboy into the digital world. We brought Homer and Bart Simpson into the third dimension. Uh, Batman, a bunch of other superhero characters and other ones onto the screen. Finally, in 1998, we got to finally create our first computer animated film with DreamWorks, uh, Ants, and that was followed soon afterwards with Shrek. It was an amazing experience and one that I'm incredibly uh, thankful to have been a part of. And it still inspires me today to help bring characters to life. But what I want to do today is take them off those screens and bring them into the real world with the rest of us. Because I think the augmented reality world that I'd like to see in the future is not one of glowing billboards and floating post-it notes and maybe a blue streak in the sky that's supposed to get us from point A to point B, but rather a world that's populated with really interesting characters, characters that want to help us, that want to teach us, and want to just entertain with us and hang out with us. Um, the interface we're going to have with those characters is not going to be gesture-based, uh, it's not going to be gaze-based. I think it's going to be really social. Here's a part of Homer joining us. Uh, it's going to be social, social the way we interact with real people, because I think in the future we're going to perceive the digital world to actually be alive. And in fact, in 15 years, it may actually be alive. And we want to interact with it as we do other living characters and living creatures. We do that in a really social way. But herein lies the challenge, because today, the state of augmented reality hardware is pretty much where computer graphics was in the early 1980s. It's cumbersome, it's expensive, and it's really only practical for very high-end specialized applications. But that gives us the opportunity and perhaps even the obligation to start to prototype out the future and the types of things that we want to do to see how it's going to work and see if that's really the place we want to be. So what I'm excited to show you is some of the projects that we've done with our students uh, at ETC, trying to bring those characters to life and, and discovering what some of the challenges that are going to be. Uh, I have a lot of examples. I'm going to focus on just three of them that we've done uh, and address some of these things as we go. Uh, one of the first pieces we did in AR was with the Epson Muverio BT200 glasses, which give you a field of view the size of an 8.5 by 11 sheet at uh, arm's length in front of you. Um, it, has, it does no location scanning, so it's aware of via GPS where you are, but it's not aware of anything in your environment, but you can use it outdoors. And so these students built a uh, navigation aid for us. It's a little flying robot, um, and as Janet mentioned before, we have a small field of view, so characters need to be small. They need to float, because if they're on the ground, you can't see it. Um, but I want you to meet Sparky, a little 30-second introduction. Can we Play that video. So here he comes. Hello, I am an augmented reality companion robot, the first of my kind. Where should we go? Hmm, let's go to Starbucks. So these little animations turned out to be really important. We are going to Starbucks at 264 Redwood Shores Parkway, Redwood City, which is 0 0.3 miles away. Is that right? Yes, you got it. Please follow me. That's right, you got the following. Turn right. We have reached our destination. Ooh, coffee! So interesting things with Sparky, he's little, um, he had to bounce to the cloud three times to get done what he needed to get done. He had to, uh, we had to do speech to text to understand what you're doing. We had to do text to context. 
We had to then go to Google Places to find out where a Starbucks was, and they had to go to Google Maps to get you the route, and all that time it's bouncing up and down, and Sparky would stand there. By having him do things like listen to you and think, those were actually enough clues to get people to realize that something's actually happening, as opposed to, you know, have a little uh, hourglass next to him or something. So being able to bring him alive and give him a little bit of personality and character helped address uh, some of those issues. Uh, we did projects where we used these glasses for multiplayer, uh, which worked okay, except with a field of view this big, um, you're not doing any eye contact with the people you're actually supposed to be interacting with. Uh, we started using the Google Tango tablet. Our first project was just taking advantage of the six degrees of freedom. Our second project with that, we actually strapped it to your face. Um, and they scanned the world in real time as you walked around and built a very Minecraft-like environment that you could go and walk around in. So you're walking through a virtual reality that was a pretty direct mapping to the real reality around you. You saw walls, you saw doors, um, you didn't see windows, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, or mirrors. You could walk into things, uh, but it worked and it was compelling. Um, and then we've moved over onto the HoloLens now. And this is another uh, guide. This is, a, uh, again, a flying robot guide who took us through the museum tour out of electronic arts. This time, the character is location aware. It knows where you are in the hallway. Um, and we'll play the video, and then I'll explain what's a little unique on this guy. Hey there, I'm Mixie, and this is the Electronic Arts History Museum. This panel is dedicated to EA Sports, our first genre of games formed in the early 1990s. John Madden was our first exclusive celebrity to agree to work with only us and not with so our I'm competitors. I'm going to speak over Mixie because it's That's not that interesting if you're not there. Um, so Mixie had a couple of things going for him. One was you could dial in what role he had be a teacher and encourage sports. you to learn things. Sure. He can be a guide which just marched you through the process. Or he could be a pretty bored companion who got really antsy if you were spending too long at some place. Um, so he would actually react to the context of what you were doing and what he was trying to show you to either keep you there and teach you things or to hurry you along. Um, and he was paying attention actually to what you're paying attention to. Uh, he also had a slider where you could change his personality types. Uh, and he had a little AI engine for developing his emotions. So he could actually go from being happy to angry, depending on how you were behaving. Uh, so he had a little bit of attitude to him. And it was a really fun experiment playing those different roles and responsibilities, not just building a guide to take you. So it was really about those other aspects. Um, we did another project. Uh, again, the characters need to be about the size of a house cat, six or eight feet away from you. Uh, this project was actually a horror adventure in your space with a Cheshire cat. Um, so about the size of a house cat, flying around, being able to fly into your field of view, uh, and you're trying to save it from haunted characters in that environment. Um, but the, other th the third piece I want to talk about is a piece we actually did in virtual reality, uh, where the students were challenged to do something really interesting with voice, interacting with a character. Uh, and what we're challenging them to do is something more than just command and control, where there's a fixed uh, vocabulary that you have that causes the characters to do something. And they ended up creating a character that had a limited vocabulary. It was an alien robot on another planet, knew some English, but not a lot of English. So you actually had to teach it nouns and adjectives in order for the two of you to accomplish the task together. So here's an excerpt from uh, using this. And this is in a VR environment. Oh, please. I see you don't speak a robot. Well, I'm sure I'll be using a decent server. I'm Babs. This is Joyce Cook. What's your name? I'm Andrew. Well, what a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Andrew. So, there aren't English words for these dishes, but I call them... And... Try grabbing one of the fruits behind you to teach me human words you can pronounce for this order. This is yellow. Yellow. What is this? I don't know. Get me this but yellow. Got it. Can you give it a name? This is a hot dog. Hot dog. This is the color blue. Blue. This is a burrito. Burrito. Get me a blue burrito. One blue burrito coming right to you. Get me a red one of these. Which one are you calling one of these? 
This is a one of these. <laughs> well, congratulations. I think we passed the test. Maybe it won't be so bad working with a human after all. So it actually worked. Um, and it was really, really fun. Thank you. Um, the nouns were anything in a dictionary, so you could call stuff anything you wanted. Uh, the adjectives in this case were all colors. We were hoping to get to do verbs and such also, but this is a team of four students in 16 weeks, and what they were able to get done was, was pretty interesting. It was really fun. It was especially fun watching people go into that world and uh, choose interesting words for the things they were holding. And they purposely made stuff that didn't look like something we were familiar with. Um, so those are three examples of things we've done that are really fun. We've had a lot of lessons about how that works. Uh, platforms are really important. Uh, they're incredibly frustrating, in particular the small field of view, a little bit about how powerful they are or are not and what they can render. Um, I think a head-mounted display is way more interesting than a handheld display because once you have a handheld display, you can't use gestures anymore. And uh, people like me love to talk with our hands, and we use that a lot. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to prototype future things, not just in these headsets. Uh, the VR turned out to be a great way to prototype this. Um, there's also other mixed reality versions. This is a thing from Stereo Labs, which is so you're looking at an all-pixel version of the world that has two stereo cameras. Um, it's interesting, but it's pretty low resolution, low frame rate, rate for uh, doing the real world. But it does give you a field of view equivalent to virtual reality instead, and, and the ability to put your characters in there with depth scanning, which is pretty interesting. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done uh, with roles and personalities of characters, because if we're really going to be interacting with these characters, it can't be on a script. Uh, we have to interact them and really uh, unique ways. They have to figure out how we want to interact. They're working for us, not us for them. Um, so figuring out those roles, those personalities, and all the other things that they're going to deal with. Uh, and then the interaction options. Uh, natural language processing is really interesting. And um, I'm hoping to take what they did last semester with Sweet Talk, take that maybe into uh, HoloLens. A lot of these things are actually up in the cloud now. There's amazing uh, APIs that are available for doing uh, AI for doing natural language processing. The uh, voice you heard there was text-to-speech using Watson in the cloud, and it gives you incredible ability to really fine-tune the voices you have. Uh, so lots of fun in the kinds of things we can do with interactions. Tons of research there. I think there's a good 15 years of work to do here, even if Ken's, Ken's prognostication of the technology being there in five years. Um, this stuff's really hard, but it's really fun. It's really interesting. Um, and I, uh, I'd be happy to show you a bunch of the other demos and uh, hope that you two are some, a little bit inspired to, to give us some social interaction with the characters in AR in the future. Thank you very much.